couldn't fire me. But He's fired. So here's my favorite part. You clap really loud like this. And then it'll see where the sound is really hot. And then I put it together. And then it'll be all synced up and pretty like. Here's our lecture on Kingdom Animalia. You can see here in this sweet, sweet cladogram. This is all a domain eukarya. Here's some protists and then there's some plants. And here's some more protists and fungi. And then look. See all this right? Yeah. Those are animals. And if you squint real good, you'll be able to see all the nine phyla plus a few others that we're going to be learning about in this unit. So, let's go ahead and get into it. First things first, there are several characteristics that all members of the kingdom Animalia have. Hold on. And don't show this at why. Why? Okay. Before we do that, though, it can also be spelled Animalia with an I or Animalia with an A. And it's going to be really hard to see this if the Illuminati doesn't hurry up and get with them lights. <laughs> this one's going to go kind of quickly like. A lot of terms and things you need to know. Obviously, that means it's composed of animals. Now, we've identified over 1.3 million different species of animals. That number goes up every year, so it's probably already outdated. However, they're estimating that there's over 200 million different species of animals out there just hanging out. Anybody want to guess what those animals most likely are? Probably. No takers. Bacteria. Ocean animals? No. Bacteria. No bacteria. Not animals. Insects. Insects, yeah. Most of them are most likely the insectals. The most successful group ever are the insects, the most successful group of the most successful group. Insects. Arguable that they rule the world, not us. The oldest animal fossils, oh look, we went backwards, why not? That's fun. Thanks, PowerPoint. The oldest group of fossils are found around 575 million years ago. That's a very, very long time ago. And it was found in, guess where? Yes, in the ocean. It's found in the ocean. All those fossils were aquatic because remember, life began in the ocean. Remember, the animals that are known as humans didn't come into the picture until all the way down here, around 200,000 years ago. So animals have been around for a little while. Plants were on land way before animals were. They had to come up here and colonize the land first because what do animals need to survive other than oxygen from the plants? Water and... We need sunlight. Pretty sure I'd be okay without sunlight. I mean, it'd be a little vitamin D deficient, but I could make it. I could make it worse than vitamins. Come on. They need something to eat. They need something to eat. So the plants had to come up here first so that there'd be something to eat, some reason to come out of the water and get on the land. Otherwise, you know, what would be the point? So to be an animal, you have to be multicellular. Plants are also multicellular. Most fungi are multicellular, even some protists are multicellular, so it's not like that's really anything new, but all animals have to be multicellular. Another feature that all animals have in common is they ingest the food before they digest the food. Spiders are a little bit of a gray area because they kind of mush it all up in their little nesting, but they eventually eat it. Different from fungi and bacteria, who just spew all their stinky, nasty digestive juices all over it and break it down and then absorb the ooze into their bodies. Which is why food stinks when it's going bad, because that's the bacteria and the fungi actually digesting it and reproducing and making more nasty, stinky bacteria everywhere. So as animals, all animals eat their things and then digest it, which also makes all animals heterotrophic. Animals are the only group that are lacking in the cell wall department. There's some protists. But this is the only group of all the same group with a shared evolutionary history, and all of us have no cell wall, which is what lets me move like this. And other movements too. The dominant form is diploid, just like in vascular plants and most other types of organisms and thingies. And we categorize the different animals based on their body plan, how their bodies are put together. You'll see what I mean when I go through the final. How many types of animals? You know that from the bell work. The answer is, now, come on. Yesterday was so good. You're making me get the cup out today. I'm going to have to now insert Red Solo Cup into the video. Hey, Tyler. 
Nine. Nine, yes, nine. We're going to look at nine phyla, although scientists recognize over 35 or around 35 different phyla of animals. I care not about all those other phyla, just the nine and ones that I feel are important. And since my name is on the door, you are forced to live with what I feel is important for you to learn to get grades in this class. And the government. I love being. No, the government has no standards about these animals. This is all me. First phylum are these things. Anybody know what these things are? Sponges. Sponges, not coral, just sponges. Just sponges. In fact, you go to the store, you can actually still buy these at Neff, which are He totally just said it. What is this? Sponge. It's a sponge. It's a sponge you use to clean pots and pans. Synthetic sponges were actually designed to mimic the skeletons of actual sponges, which is phylum Porifera. Anyone of you want to guess why they call it porifera? Because of the pores. Look, 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 look at the pores. 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 There are pores all over it. Almost all sponges have this big gaping open hole at the top. They're the first animals ever. In fact, they're pretty much barely animals. They're borderline almost just a colony of things living together. They're totally asymmetrical. If you happen to find a symmetrical sponge, it was just by dumb luck. In addition to that, they have no tissues. They have specialized cells, but those specialized cells don't group together to form a tissue. I'm not talking about like, oh, if they start crying, they can't blow their nose tissue. A tissue is a group of cells that are all the same type of cells, all working together to perform some kind of function, and these things ain't got none. Those are the sponges. Questions about sponges? No? Great. Next, you have these things. What are these? Jellyfish. This is phylum Cnidaria. The C is silent, but you have to put it in there because it's there. Phylum Cnidaria. Your jellyfishes, your CM and them among enemies, and these are actually where your coral belong as well. They're totally different phylum from the sponges. It looks sort of like sponges, and that's about it. These things have radial symmetry. So one of the major differences between the coral and the sponges, they're actually symmetrical. Radial symmetry, that's the one where you can cut it like this, and like this, and like this, and like this, and pretty much an infinite number of times, and it will still be symmetrical. They form perfect circles, so they were the first ones to evolve the symmetry. Remember, we're looking at their evolutionary history, looking at what traits cross over to the next phyla, and the next phyla, and the next phyla. Anybody know what these things are? takers? No. There's these things called hydras. Oh. They're called hydras. They don't move, but they put out these tentacles, and the tentacles grab the things. These are the first things to have any kind of tissues, any kind of coordinated muscle movement, and to actually have nerves. So these can actually respond to stimuli. Unlike sponges, you could poke them, prod them, electrocute them, and they'll just sit there and be like, hey, I'm a sponge. But these things can actually respond to stimuli. They have these stinging tentacles called nematocysts. Have you ever, buddy, ever been stung by a jellyfish? Like, How would you categorize the feeling? It hurts. Itching and burning. Itching and burning. What about right when it happened? It feels like, it almost feels like a bee sting, but ten times. Yeah. Do you know why? Why? Because a bee sting stabs you with one stinger, these stab you with thousands of stingers. Each injecting a neurotoxin, which is where the itching and the burning comes from. Contrary to popular belief, they don't actually electrocute you, instead they inject you with poison. One of the most deadly organisms on the world is a box jellyfish. Looks like this one, they're about this big. Almost totally invisible because they're translucent, they're found off the coast of Australia. If one stings you, you will die in under 10 minutes unless you're given the antitoxin. So can we ask the obvious question here? What? Can we ask the obvious question here? Does peeing on the person yeah, actually, like, help with the poison? Nope. Not at all. Not even a little bit. In fact, if you're out in the ocean and you pee, it actually attracts them to you. Probably shouldn't pee in freshwater either because there's freshwater jellyfish and we actually have some in Knox Lake. That's funny. I'm pretty sure I know exactly what happened though. Some native guy is like, hey, watch this. I'm going to trick this white person into letting me pee on them. <laughs> like, oh, I see you got jellyfish sting. I pee on it. You feel better. <laughs> they're like, oh please, oh please, I hurt so bad. Yeah. 
I mean, I wouldn't correct any of your friends, but they get stung and they're going to let you pee on them. I'd be like, all right, time to help. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. A story that can never be let down. Doesn't help. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Next you have these things. These things are very, very flat. In fact, they're commonly called the flatworms. They're about as thick as this piece of paper. That's it. Very, very thin. Now this phylum name is kind of a monster to say, so let's practice it together. Class, repeat after me. Platy. 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 Hell. Hell. Nymph. Ease. Ease. Now it has to be everybody, otherwise some of you are going to have to say it by yourself. It's platy helminthes all together. It's platy, platy hell, hell, minth, minth ease. ease. Now all together, platy, platy hell, hell, no, no, no. All together means I put the word together. You have to wait still. Platy helminthes. Your turn. Platy helminthes. Now let's do it again, but everybody together. Platy helminthes. Platy helminthes. Very good. Now just Lexi by yourself. I said it every time. Oh, I didn't say it loud enough. Platy helminthes. Perfect. That was I wonderful. Platy helminthes, these are the flatworms. They can be marine, they can be freshwater. <laughs> these ones here are actually freshwater. You can find them all over the place. Some of them have eye spots, not actual eyes. They do have tissues and they do have nerves, and if you poke them, they'll be like, hey, who's poking me? And they can sense things in the water, but they can't see anything. Nothing so far has been capable of seeing anything, even a little bit. So, how do their organs go about? They don't have organs. What are they? Flatworms. That does not answer my question. <laughs> so, this is a flatworm, and this, Kyle, is a flatworm. That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, they're, they're pretty flat. Now, a lot, of them, a lot of them are parasitic, but most of them are, tend to actually be free living. These ones are really cool, in addition to the eye spots, which people think they mostly evolve to be scary to other things because it looks like they see you, but yeah, they, they don't see you. They have some nerves spread throughout, but they don't even really have like a brain region where most of those nerves are. They have sort of the precursors to cephalization, but no actual cephalization. In addition to that, you can cut them into about 1 178th of its size, and each of those little bits will grow into 178 new planaria, which is what this particular flatworm is called, as long as it's been well fed and nourished because the majority of its body is made out of stem cells. Well, now we know why it so has hell in its name. That's where it came from. Piece of tissue. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's pretty much just a moving piece of tissue. Yeah, no no organs or no... Yeah, they're not bad. They're free living. They're, they're fine. They're not going to oh, That it. fills my nightmares. Something that doesn't have... Like that's how this just tissue. Funny. It's just <laughs> tissue. And would it make you feel better if I told you that they're smaller than your fingernail? No! Oh. They're empty. Are you They're visible. On YouTube? Kyle, just imagine a mass horn. It's not that, it's just the picture. Now I'm going to have to edit organ. out Chance's comments because I'm pretty sure he just said a bad word and my channel certifies that there's no bad words. I said a mass horn. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> These things over here, a horde of them, I see. A horde of them. <laughs> These are roundworms, phylum nematoda. Guess how they look? Round, you're right, they look round. These are a little bit more complex than flatworms. Now, they're not round like this paper would be round. All right? They're round like if you went like this and sort of did this with it, they're round. Does that make sense? You see how those things are different? They're more complex than the flatworms. They're thread-like, and most of them are also parasitic. This, for example, is one worm that came out of one person's body. Oh. Yeah. Cool. yeah, when you get your dogs like dewormed, outside of tapeworms, if it's like a heartworm or a liverworm or stuff like that, those are usually these kind of worms, mm -hmm. the round worms. They're nasty. This one crawls into your foot through the soil. You're going around barefoot, drills its way in, nicknamed the fireworm because it feels like burning when it's living inside of you. I feel like you notice that. You would, but you wouldn't be able to stop it. Cool. Yep, they just get in there and eat your body and grow and, you know, be a parasite. What, what is, is fun, our last unit, who has allergies in here? Who suffers from the allergies? Yeah, me too. It's terrible, isn't it? Scientists have actually found that if you're infected with a parasite, like one of these nice ones, no more allergies. 
Your immune system's too busy battling the parasite to worry about little useless things like pollen that doesn't affect you. So maybe you that's why we don't have allergies. We have one. We have parasites. <laughs> so, in case, in case you were wondering, ladies, just so you know, Kyle has a parasite. Yep. <laughs> I am a parasite in itself. <laughs> Alrighty, next, we have these things. You'll notice on its body, you see these things? Guess what these are? The little sections. Yes. They're segments. They're segments. These are segment of worms, phylum annelida, also known as the annelid worms. These were the precursor to allowing our bodies to become so complex because they brought two really interesting things to the table. They brought an actual body cavity. Right? These are coelomates. C oh, coelom. That's one of our words this week. What's that mean? Cavity. Cavity. So we got the body cavity, a nice hollow tube that allows it to grow organs. These are the first things we're going to look at that actually have organs inside of them, true, fully functional organs. And it's because they got this nice hollow tube inside of them called a cavity, a body cavity. Also allows for a really coordinated movement on land, which is the first time that things can really move on land. Most of those other organs we looked at are primarily aquatic. Round worms can be on land and they flop around like this. This is how they move. Yep. And they swim, they flop around like this. That's all they can do. Nightmares. These can actually crawl and, you know, do all the normal worm type activities. These led to compartmentalization. The reason why you have like a defined chest area and a head area and, you know, lower extremities is because these started the ability of segmenting the body, turning it into separate sections that can sort of work independently of each other. Big difference from the others. These include things that people think are flatworms like leeches and tapeworms are actually segmented worms. And tube worms, which are these really cool worms that live down at the deep parts of the ocean near hydrothermal vents and look really cool. More complex, first time we got organs and they actually also are the first thing to have a defined nerve cord. Everything after the annelids has a beautiful nerve cord and it also always runs along the belly. Question, where's your nerve cord? Uh, yeah, spinal cord on your back, right? So everything else has it right up their belly. Imagine if getting punched in the gut could cripple you. That's the life they live. More on those later. Next phylum has these things, the clams and the clammy snailies and octopi and squidbillies and also the cuttlefish and all those other things. These are mollusks, phylum mollusca. Oftentimes the C right here gets turned into a K technically should be a C. So if you feel like trolling somebody, you're like, actually, that should be spelled with a C. By the mollusca, the mollusks. These animals have this thing called a mantle. I'm not talking about the part over top of your fireplace, but an archaic word for coat or cloak or clothy thing you flop over your body to try and stay protected from the outdoors when you have to ride horses and whatnot. So they have really, really soft body. They have these muscular foot type things, which the plural ends up being actually foots for them instead of feet like you think it would be, because why not? And they have these really soft bodies, like I said before, that they cover in the mantle for a little bit of protection. Many of them produce a calcium carbonate shell, which is how like chalk and other things like that are formed from the dissolved shell parts. And there's three classes of mollusks that we'll learn about later. These were the first group for some of them to develop the eyeball they can actually see. So finally, we've gone through all these phyla, and these ones are the first ones that can really see anything. Yep, that's fun. Next you have these ones who can also see stuff. Who are these? You know what they're called. Arachnids. Yeah, there's some arachnids. What's this? Spiny. Spiny. Spiny thingy. Lobster. Lobster. Is that the assassin bug? Uh, no, the assassin bug is way scarier. Assassin bug has this big, like, its like mouth part turns into a dagger and it's yeah. like sticking up. And when it goes for the kill, it like turns into a dagger that it stabs down on its prey. That's awesome. That is so nice. Mister Mister Scooter had one, and he put it in the cage with the praying mantis to see who would win. Who won? They avoided each other cleverly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure though, praying mantis would probably win though. I saw a movie. You can watch it on YouTube where praying mantis takes out a mouse. Like a full-on, like, mouse. Yeah, it just comes over and the mouse is like, oh crap, and the big man is like, I'm gonna eat your boy. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, so this is phylum Arthropoda. Guess what they brought to the table? What's Arthro? 
other than scariness, what did they bring to the table? Arthro. Joint. Joint. What about poda? My favorite word, pod. Feet. These have the jointed legs. They include spiders, crustaceans, and all your general insectoid type things. The most successful phylum on land. Also the first phylum to come up with flying as a thing. All of them have a delicious exoskeleton and obviously the joints because without them you would move like this. Nope, couldn't even do that. Those are joints. So they developed, you know, these exoskeletons gave you a really nice attachment point, gave you a lot of leverage on your muscles, and they also invented the ability to have separate moving parts. They invented the joint, which these things kind of also have. These branched off just before us. They're the only phylum. Did you notice all the other phyla have that bilateral symmetry? You can cut them in half pretty much up the middle. These actually all have five-part symmetry and are all marine. This is phylum Echinodermata, one of my favorite ones to say. Echinodermata includes the starfish and sea urchins and other stuff like that. So I know you're going to be nervous about saying this one out loud, so let's practice Echino. Dermata. Dermata. Now you put it all together, you got Echinodermata. Echinodermata. Now we need some more practice. Listen, Echinodermata. Echinodermata. Now it's a little faster. Ooh. Echinodermata. Echinodermata. Now Kenzie just by herself. Echinodermata. Perfect. Echinodermata. Anybody know what that means? Should recognize at least one science word in there in a kind of dermata. Derm. What's that mean? Derm. Yeah, skin. You go to a dermatologist, that would be the skin doctor. Mostly they have these little tube feet thingies that they sort of stick down and they move like. So it looks like they're sort of crawling or slinking along the floor, but they actually have little tiny feet. Especially starfish, which are one of the most aggressive predators ever. Echino refers to it being spiny, so they all have these little spine things. Mrs. Steen was just talking about they used to do a starfish dissection. She did it one year and it ruined all of her dissecting scissors. They're pretty spiny. They've got these hard interlocking parts on the inside, almost like a precursor to a skeleton. In addition to that, the... What? Critical warning. Stop because of me. What? I have like 30 gigs on the hard drive. What happens if I hit resume? Delete. You can also delete or stop. I'll free up some space. I'll give you free up some space. What if I just click it and I don't free up anything? That's what I thought. Somebody give me a new computer for Christmas. Sea urchins have these really stabby spiny things, and on top of that, they have a mouth on the inside that has more leverage than any other mouth, including the crocodiles. Bite your finger, clean off. It kind of dramatic. And then we have these things. These are what you usually think when you think of animals. Stuff like fishes and amphibians and bears and snakes and all those. This is phylum chordata. Phylum chordata. Named because of the notochord, which is this protective and moderately supportive structure that runs up your back. Ours is highly modified into vertebrae. So all vertebrates are actually in phylum chordata, everything with a backbone, everything with bones, period. These are all chordates. Also the only clade that has the, the protective nerve cord, or has, sorry, has the nerve cord running up your back. You realize those are two separate things. Yes, your spine and your nerve cord are actually two separate entities, right? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah, yeah they're two honest. separate entities. But that notochord, which we've turned into a spine, allows the bodies to work the way they do. Gives a good attachment point for all other bones and all other structures and really allows our bodies to be as powerful as they are. Any questions about animals? These are also the first ones that have really good sets of organ systems. Although, in some respects, many of the mollusks and echinoderms have them. Questions about the animals? Yes, no, maybe? Great. Well, that will be that then. Kyle, if you would hit the red button to stop the recording over there, and I'll stop the recording over here.